Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is sequence valves. Our objective is to examine a pressure control valve known as a sequence valve, commonly used to coordinate a multi-actuator system. This lecture operates under the assumption you've watched the vented and remote controlled pressure relief valves lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet or only dimly recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. The sequence valve is just one of a larger family of pressure control valves. Recall during the hydraulic schematics lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, we briefly discussed this family on an introductory level. Pressure control valves look and behave astoundingly similar to one another. Pressure control valves, as the name implies, do something when pressure reaches a certain value. Pressure control valves come in five main types. Pressure relief valves, sequence valves, counterbalance valves, pressure reducing valves, and unloading valves. When first introduced to this family in mass, you'll note they're hard to differentiate from one another. This being said, if you know what characteristics to look for, they're easy to distinguish and identify. The characteristics I use to classify them are as follows. Pilot line, deactivated state, whether the valve has a check valve bypass or not, whether the drain is internal or external, and finally, location and perceived function. This might be a review of this topic. However, repeat exposure to this topic is pretty helpful. Pilot line. All pressure control valves monitor pressure using a dashed pilot port. Sometimes the pilot line is internal to the valve or can be an external remote connection. Internal pilot lines can monitor the valve's input or primary port, as in the case of a pressure relief valve and certain configurations of sequence and counterbalance valves or the internal pilot line can monitor the valve's output or secondary port, as in the case of pressure reducing valves. External or remote pilot lines can be found in the case of unloading valves and certain configurations of sequence and counterbalance valves. Deactivated state. All pressure control valves have a deactivated state. When pressure in the pilot line exceeds the adjustable set value, the valve actuates into its opposite state. Most of these valves are normally closed that open when pressure exceeds the set value and, for all intents and purposes, operate just like an ordinary pressure relief valve. The exception to this characteristic being the pressure reducing valve. Pressure reducing valves are normally open and when pressure exceeds the set value, the valve closes. That's a dead giveaway. Check valve bypasses. Some of these valves have check valve bypasses, some of them don't. The ones with check valve bypasses, like sequence, counterbalance, and pressure reducing valves, are designed to control pressure in one direction and then be bypassed in another. The ones without check valve bypasses, like pressure relief valves and unloading valves, are ordinarily employed in regions with unidirectional flow paths, rendering reverse operation a non-issue. Drain ports. Some of these valves necessitate external drains, some of them don't. The ones with external drains, like sequence and pressure reducing valves, have pressurized secondary ports. The ones with internal drains, like pressure relief, unloading, and counterbalance valves, are intended to operate with a secondary port at low pressure, rendering an external drain unnecessary. Location and perceived function. Finally, and most importantly, very often the location of a pressure control valve is a dead giveaway about the valve's true nature. Pressure relief valves are always between the pump and the tank. Unloading valves are also known to loiter around the pump. However, they're easily distinguishable from pressure relief valves since their pilot passage isn't internal to the valve, but rather a remote external connection. Sequence valves hang out around the input of actuators, as do pressure reducing valves. They're distinguishable from each other since sequence valves are normally closed and pressure reducing valves are normally open. Counterbalance valves are the opposite. They hang around the output of actuators. If location and perceived functions still doesn't clue you in, sometimes the schematic includes specific port identifiers and goes to the trouble of directly referencing the valve in a legend. Long story short, anytime one of the pressure control valve quintuplets pop up, you should be able to run through the list. Pilot line, deactivated state, check valve bypass, drain, and location and perceived function and check off as many identifiable characteristics as possible. Sooner or later, you'll hit upon which valve you're looking at. Let's see if we can classify the sequence valve, the topic of this particular lecture, using these characteristics. Most sequence valves use an internal pilot line 
that monitors pressure on the input port. Alternatively, some configurations of sequence valves utilize an external remote pilot line. We'll examine both of these configurations. Sequence valves are normally closed valves that open when pressure in the pilot line exceeds the adjustable set value. For all intents and purposes, sequence valves are just like pressure relief valves with some subtle modifications that we'll examine in a moment. Customarily, the primary or input port on a sequence valve is labeled P for pressure, and the output or secondary port is labeled S for sequence. If the sequence valve uses an external pilot port, let's call it port X. Sequence valves ordinarily include a check valve bypass because they're employed in regions with bi-directional flow paths. The check valve bypass allows the sequence valve to control pressure in one direction and be bypassed in another. If the sequence valve does not include a check valve bypass internal to the valve enclosure, a separate external check valve must be employed to allow this functionality. Sequence valves require an external drain since their output port is pressurized. External drains are symbolized by a dotted connection to tank. The drain port connection is customarily labeled D for obvious reasons. Note the external drain port is essential to the proper functionality of a sequence valve, and a sequence valve isn't just a regular pressure relief valve with a check valve bypass. Recall that a regular pressure relief valve has an internal drain because its output port isn't pressurized and is rather drained to tank at low pressure. As we'll soon learn, the output S port of a sequence valve is pressurized, and if the drain was routed to the S port, a significant back pressure would develop in the drain line and hinder the proper functionality of the sequence valve. External drains at low tank pressure allow any accumulated fluid that has leaked past the seals to be channeled away, continue the free movement of the internal components. External drains are customarily routed back to the reservoir above normal fluid level to ensure free movement of the drain fluid and no back pressure develops in the drain line. Finally, sequence valves are customarily found on the inputs of actuators and coordinate or sequence the action of multi-actuator systems. Note the term input is relative in nature since both ports of a double acting cylinder or bidirectional hydraulic motor could rightly be considered either an input or output depending upon direction of flow. Similar to the guidance I issued in the flow control methods lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel, it is not necessarily the valve or actuator port that determines the sequence valve's orientation, but rather the check valve bypass that does so. For example, this sequence valve is on the input of the cap end of this double acting cylinder. Only when pressure on the input port exceeds the set value of the sequence valve does the sequence valve open and extend the cylinder. When flow switches direction, the sequence valve is bypassed through the check valve bypass and the cylinder retracts with no pressure precondition. Similarly, this sequence valve is on the input of this bidirectional hydraulic motor when flow travels left to right. Only when pressure on the input port exceeds the set value does the sequence valve open and spin the hydraulic motor in one direction. When flow switches direction, the sequence valve is bypassed through the check valve bypass and the hydraulic motor spins in the opposite direction with no pressure precondition. Note that normally closed sequence valves open when pressure on their pilot port rises above the set value. Most sequence valves typically keep inlet pressure in the primary circuit at the set value and stay open as long as there is a differential between input and output. Once pressure equalizes at the input and output, the sequence valve is considered fully open and pressure can then rise to the setting of the main pressure relief valve. We'll discuss kickdown sequence valves in a moment that exhibit slightly different behavior. Note that sequence valves can either be direct or pilot operated with the understanding that a direct acting sequence valve might be faster acting than a pilot operated sequence valve. However, perhaps illustrate early creep of the sequenced actuator given direct acting valves tend to exhibit cracking behavior. The classic application example of sequence valves used since the first caveman invented the first sequence valve is a clamp and bend circuit operated by a single directional control valve. Note the desired function is to first clamp and then bend the object. Not clamp bend the object all at once, or worse yet, bend it, then clamp it. A sequence valve can be used to automatically coordinate this desired actuation sequence. Consider a two-cylinder 
parallel hydraulic circuit operated by a single directional control valve without a sequence valve coordinating its action. When an operator actuates the directional control valve into the straight through position, the clamp and bend cylinders are placed in parallel with one another and sequence of actuation is entirely dependent upon the pressure requirements of a given cylinder and flow is routed to the one with the lowest requirement first. If the bend cylinder actuated first without the workpiece being properly clamped, it might potentially dislodge the workpiece and ruin it. For this reason, consider the exact same circuit with a sequence valve, SVB extend, on the cap end of the bend cylinder. In this upgraded circuit, when an operator actuates the directional control valve into the straight through position, the normally closed sequence valve initially prevents the extension of the bend cylinder and only the clamp cylinder extends. When the clamp cylinder makes contact with the workpiece, pressure rises to that of the set value of the sequence valve. Let's say this set value is 400 psi, equivalent to the pressure necessary for the clamp cylinder to generate force sufficient to properly clamp the workpiece. When pressure reaches 400 psi, the sequence valve maintains pressure in the primary circuit at 400 psi and opens, allowing the bend cylinder to extend. When the bend cylinder makes contact with a properly clamped workpiece, pressure on the downstream side of the sequence valve rises to that of the set point, at which time the sequence valve is considered fully open and pressure would continue to rise. When the bend cylinder bottoms out at the limits of travel, pressure rises to that of the main pressure relief valve. Let's say the main pressure relief valve has a set value of 800 psi. Pressure in both actuators rises to 800 psi and the bend cylinder completes bending the object. Note how the pressure decision made by the sequence valve coordinated the actuation sequence of this multi-actuator system using a single directional control valve. Now it has currently implemented the sequence valve only makes a decision based on pressure. It never actually checks if the clamp cylinder is fully extended or not. While potentially advantageous for manufacturing processes that make use of different thickness materials, this could be problematic if the clamp cylinder ever reached the limits of travel early due to an obstruction, if the clamp cylinder jammed, or ever had a blocked port. In these scenarios, pressure would still rise to that of the sequence valve set value and the bend cylinder might actuate prematurely. For this reason, we'll revisit significantly more robust clamp and bend circuits in later lectures on electrically controlled hydraulic systems, making use of limit switches that confirm the physical travel of the clamp cylinder prior to actuating the bend cylinder. Additionally note, as currently implemented, the clamp cylinder pressure also rises to 800 psi the setting of the main pressure relief valve. We'll examine the pressure reducing valve, a related pressure control valve in later lectures that can be used to limit and maintain pressure in specific branches of a larger hydraulic system. A pressure reducing valve would allow the clamp cylinder to experience less pressure, thereby not marring the clamped workpiece. When the directional control valve is shifted to the cross connect position, note the check valve bypass bypasses the sequence valve and allows the bend cylinder to retract with no pressure precondition. Note as currently implemented, during retraction, both cylinders are placed in parallel with one another and sequence of retraction is pressure dependent. While suitable for some applications, this might not be the most desirable of scenarios if we wanted to ensure the clamp cylinder maintained the workpiece secure while the bend cylinder retracted and then retract the clamp cylinder as a final step. For this reason, consider yet another sequence valve, SVC retract on the rod end of the clamp cylinder that allows this additional functionality. When the directional control valve is shifted to the straight through position, this upgraded circuit would first extend the clamp cylinder, then extend the bend cylinder, ensuring the bend cylinder only bends a properly clamped workpiece as previously. Then, when the directional control valve is shifted back to the cross connect position, this circuit first retracts the bend cylinder, then retracts the clamp cylinder. Allow me to demonstrate. When an operator actuates the directional control valve into the straight through position, the normally closed sequence valve, SVB extend, initially prevents the extension of the bend cylinder and only the clamp cylinder extends. Note the check valve bypass on sequence valve C retract bypasses this valve and the clamp cylinder extends with no pressure precondition. When the clamp cylinder makes contact with the workpiece, 
pressure rises to that of the set value of SVB extend. At this point, SVB extend maintains pressure in the primary circuit and opens, allowing the bend cylinder to extend. When the bend cylinder makes contact with a properly clamped workpiece, pressure continues to rise in the entire circuit. The bend cylinder bends the properly clamped object until it bottoms out at the limits of travel and pressure rises to that of the main pressure relief valve. Again, note how the pressure decision made by SVB extend coordinates the actuation sequence as provided by the straight through position of the directional control valve and SVC retract is bypassed. Long story short, clamp the object first, then bend it. When the directional control valve is shifted back to the cross connect position, note the check valve bypass bypasses SVB extend and allows the bend cylinder to retract with no pressure precondition. However, the normally closed SVC retract initially prevents the retraction of the clamp cylinder. Only when the bend cylinder fully retracts does pressure rise to that of the set value of SVC retract. At this point, SVC retract maintains pressure in the primary circuit and opens, allowing the clamp cylinder to retract. Note how the pressure decision made by SVC retract coordinates the actuation sequence as provided by the cross connect position of the directional control valve and SVB extend is bypassed. Long story short, retract the bend cylinder first, then retract the clamp cylinder. Moving on, not all sequence valves use internal pilot lines. Consider a sequence valve with an external remote pilot line used to coordinate two separate actuators using two independent directional control valves. The classic application example being the stabilizing booms used on crane or ladder trucks. The booms must first make contact with the ground before the crane or ladder can be extended. The external pilot line on the sequence valve on the cap end of the cylinder used to extend the crane ensures that despite the crane action being operator controlled, sufficient pressure must exist in the booms prior to doing so. In this application, the externally piloted sequence valve serves as a sanity check on an operator's decision making and an operator serves as a sanity check on the sequence valve. Rather than fully automatically sequencing both actuators as previously, both the sequence valve and the operator must be in agreement for the crane to extend. Allow me to demonstrate. An unusually carefree operator hops into the cab of a crane and says cranes away and actuates directional control valve two, the directional control valve controlling the crane. Given the booms are retracted, pressure in the external pilot line is below the set value and the normally closed sequence valve remains closed and the crane does not extend. The externally piloted sequence valve just saved this operator and crane a potential rollover. Only when an operator sits back and takes the time to carefully read the operator's manual that explicitly says, attention dummy, fully lower the booms prior to extending the crane will the system function as intended. When the operator actuates DCV1, the directional control valve controlling the stabilizing booms, the stabilizing booms extend. When the booms make contact with the ground, pressure rises and the external remote pilot line signals the sequence valve and the crane controlling circuit to open. Only now can an operator actuate directional control valve 2 and extend the crane. If an operator wished to retract the crane, Note the check valve bypass would bypass this sequence valve in reverse operation, allowing the cylinder to retract with no pressure precondition. Variations of sequence valves, called kickdown style sequence valves, exist that exhibit similar yet subtly different behavior. Note when a regular sequence valve shifts open, it maintains pressure in the primary circuit. Kickdown sequence valves, in contrast, when shifted to the open position, shift and stay open like a regular valve, yet do not maintain pressure on the primary circuit. This could be advantageous for circuits in which efficiency is a prime consideration. While maintaining pressure in the primary circuit, note there would exist a significant pressure differential across the sequence valve until pressure in the sequenced cylinder equalized and pressure in the whole circuit started to rise. A kickdown sequence valve, in contrast, does not maintain pressure in the primary circuit and when actuated, it just opens up and stays open. Pressure in the whole system would drop to whatever it took to actuate the sequenced actuator. This particular circuit, coordinating the activity of the stabilizing booms and cranes, 
would not be an ideal candidate for a kickdown style sequence valve since the booms must be relied upon as a solid base. Consider, however, a circuit that uses the first unsequenced cylinder to shove a load onto a platform or conveyor belt, then using another cylinder sequenced by a kickdown style sequence valve raises, lowers, pushes, pulls, or otherwise manipulates the now supported load. For this application, there really would be no reason to maintain pressure in the primary circuit, given it's now supported by a platform or conveyor belt, thus the choice of the more efficient kickdown style sequence valve. Sequence valves need not be exclusively used to coordinate the actuation sequence of multi-actuator systems. Sequence valves can also be used as a substitute for other valves, or employed in single actuator systems to modify performance characteristics. A sequence valve, if you think about it, is just like a regular pressure relief valve, except it has an external drain and sometimes includes check valve bypasses. If the reservoir for a hydraulic system is subject to variable back pressure conditions because the fluid might be too cold or too warm, you could theoretically substitute an externally drained sequence valve for an internally drained pressure relief valve given the check valve bypass would not be functional in this unidirectional flow path. The only difference between this configuration and one employing a regular pressure relief valve is that the sequence valve playing the part of the pressure relief valve now has an external drain that can hopefully overcome the variable back pressure issues existing in the reservoir. Consider yet another application for sequence valves, that of breaking a load with considerable inertia. As discussed in the vented and remote control pressure relief valve lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, when flow suddenly stops for a hydraulic motor in the act of rotating, the inertia of the rotor and driven load continues to rotate the shaft as if it were a pump. Given a closed center position directional control valve or an otherwise blocked port, the oil pumped by this action slams to a stop and pressure spikes. The faster the motor and the heavier the driven load, the greater the pressure spike. This pressure spike can damage the motor, the directional control valve, hoses, and or fittings. Additionally, the inlet experiences partial vacuum conditions and can cavitate just like a pump starved of fluid during the suction phase. In the vented and remote control pressure relief valve lecture, we discuss float or motor center valves and a related device called a crossover pressure relief valve used to mitigate these undesirable effects. Consider, however, a sequence valve being used to break a hydraulic motor. In this scenario, the sequence valve provides an alternate path to the tank when pressure rises above the set value. Note the check valve on the left actuator port serves to ensure that this hydraulic motor application is unidirectional. When in the cross-connect position, the check valve blocks pressurized flow and the hydraulic motor is at a standstill. When the directional control valve is shifted to the straight-through position, the check valve opens and the motor accelerates in one direction. When the directional control valve is shifted back to the cross-connect position, the inertia of the driven load continues turning the shaft as if the hydraulic motor were a pump. This time, however, the sequence valve opens when pressure spikes, serving to gradually decelerate the motor and driven load rather than letting it slam to a halt. Note the maintained connection and check valve orientation on the other port of the hydraulic motor serves to ensure no partial vacuum condition is created at the inlet thus preventing cavitation problems. Once the pressure spike subsides, the sequence valve closes and completely breaks the motor. For bidirectional hydraulic motor applications, two sequence valves and two check valve bypasses can be used to decelerate the motor and applied load. Note a sequence valve on either actuator port serves to bleed off the pressure spike regardless of direction of rotation, and the check valve on the opposite actuator port serves to ensure no partial vacuum condition is created, thus preventing cavitation problems. When in the closed center position, the directional control valve spool closed center blocks both pressurized flow and the connection to tank. The hydraulic motor is at a standstill. When the directional control valve is shifted to the straight through position, the motor accelerates in one direction. When the directional control valve is shifted back to the closed center position, the inertia of the driven load continues turning the shaft as if the hydraulic motor were a pump. When pressure spikes, the sequence valve on this port opens up, serving to gradually decelerate the motor and driven load rather than letting it slam to a halt. Note the check valve on the other actuator port serves to ensure no partial vacuum condition is created, thus preventing cavitation problems.
Once the pressure spike subsides, the sequence valve closes and completely breaks the motor. You should find similar behavior when the directional control valve is shifted to the cross connect position and returned to the closed center. Note the sequence valves for this application control the amount of back pressure generated when the motor comes to a stop. The braking period can be changed by adjusting the set value of the sequence valve. An extremely high set value would stop the motor much more abruptly than a low set value. Note for this bidirectional hydraulic motor application, the check valves really aren't bypasses, but rather serve to ensure a connection to tank to prevent cavitation during the braking period. For this application, they're often referred to as makeup check valves rather than bypass check valves. All right, that's about it. To be sure, numerous other sequence valve applications exist, but that's about all we've got time for today. Later lectures, we'll examine the other members of the pressure control valve family. Until then, that's all I've got for you. In conclusion, this lecture introduced the sequence valve. We discussed internally and externally piloted sequence valves used to coordinate the actuation sequence of multi-actuator systems, as well as discussed kickdown style sequence valves and sequence valves used as substitutes for pressure relief valves and sequence valves used in single actuator systems. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.